Good morning and welcome aboard to Bara at Home. Please take your seats and be ready to take off into our sermon. First, let's go over a few safe ways to enjoy Bara at Home. Please put all distractions and or electronics away at this time. Grab your nearest Bible and or pen and journal. If at any reason you should need to use the bathroom, be sure to do this before or after Bara at Home. Grab a complimentary snack and drink before we take off into God's Word. If at any time you feel the need to say amen, please do so like this. Now that you are all set for a safe bar at home, you can now enjoy this gathering. Be sure to share this event online. We look forward to enjoying bar at home with you. Hello, thank you for joining us for bar at home. Um, just before we get started today, um, I just want to take a moment and just and, and say a few words and, and pray. And everything right now is just a little crazy around our country. Um, this, this past season has been crazy. This past week has been crazy. And uh, I was talking to my wife the other night about it, and um, we were just sitting there. And she was telling me, she's like, sometimes I get so caught up in my job um, and in my friendships and my, my daily life, and I forget that earth is not our forever home. And I just want to encourage you, whatever you may be feeling this week, whatever you may have been feeling this season or even past seasons, it can get crazy. But just to remind you, the Bible says that this life is but a mere vapor. And my prayer today is that we would feel a touch of heaven, that we would feel heaven come down on earth, and we would realize that no matter what's going on in life, that this is not our forever home. Join me as we pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you, God, that no matter what's happened in our past, what's happened this past season, what happened this past week, God, that nothing, no height nor depth, could separate us from your love. And I pray, Jesus, that your will would be done today on earth as it is in heaven. Could we feel the touch of heaven?
I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me For change to come, knowing the battles won. For you have never fed me. Your promise still stands. It is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness.
God, I pray um, just in the waiting, a lot of times it could be frustrating because we know that you're a good God. Yet we, we see bad around us. We see injustice around us. God, I pray um, that we wouldn't we wouldn't grow weary doing good. And we would believe, like we just sang, that your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. No matter how it feels, no matter how it looks. God, I'm still in your hands. And this is my confidence. You've never filled me in. God, I pray that you would um, just bring comfort to those who need comforting right now. And you would bring peace to the, the restless and anxious hearts. Five simple words. The Star Wars saga was forever changed. A surprise ending caught Luke Skywalker and audiences alike in complete shock. Because what Obi-Wan Kenobi had said wasn't exactly true. Luke's father was not in fact dead. And with five simple words, there's a plot twist for the ages. Perhaps the reason the sequel of The Empire Strikes Back was even more liked and seen than the original. Those five simple words were, of course, Luke, I am your father, spoken by Darth Vader to Luke. Today's story in the life of Gideon has a plot twist as well. We'll see that the biblical authors do not mince words. They, they don't airbrush the warts and the wrongs and the wounds of the heroes that we fall in love with in Scripture. In fact, it's their mistakes, their, their fallen character that gives us a little bit of hope we can identify with them. And so we see this authentic betrayal in the life of Gideon. You would hope that as we finished up chapter 7 that it would end with the words from Judges 8.28, which read, Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again during Gideon's lifetime. The land had peace 40 years. That'd be a good ending, but that's not the ending. We're going to see that there's some problems to the end of Gideon's story. He makes some mistakes, some crucial mistakes that plague and mar the rest of his life as well as his legacy. And today, I, I alluded to last week, I said today is a, a message of warning. We're going to look at the warning. He's already won the battle. He's already done the dirty work of taking out all the idols in the land. And yet, there's still some pain at the end of the story, a plot twist, if you will. The first warning is that we need to anticipate problems. And I don't want to be negative or, or, or you know, glass half empty, but the reality is that often after a great victory, we think that maybe this is how it's going to be. We think things are going to be great, and everyone's going to love us, and everything's going to go smooth, and everything's going to be as it should be. But if we're wise, we would do well to anticipate problems. That's exactly what... Gideon comes up against. Judges chapter 8, verse 1. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. 
The enemies that attacked Israel relentlessly, and the tribes, Edomites were one of them, that, that just bombarded them and waylaid them and, and stole from them and killed them, completely are annihilated by Gideon. And the Edomites have the, the nerve, the audacity to challenge them vict- vigorously and say, how come you didn't call us? Like, like they had no clue this was going to happen. Like they had no clue there was an enemy. It, it, it's a complete complainer spirit, a critical spirit. Uh, it's the difference between a winner and a whiner. A lot of people show up after the work's done and, and whine about it or complain. Uh, I, I would say that they're drinking the haterade. It, it, it's one of those things that, that you think, man, everyone's going to be so happy that we finally beat our enemies. And they're like, we did not get a formal invitation to the battle, and now we're upset. So this, this uh, COVID reopening of the building has, has brought some, a, a little bit on to, to me and many other church leaders. In fact, I saw this graphic, this, this little uh, picture of, of all the things that a pastor is dealing with right now. You can't open the church building yet. It's a huge health risk. You're wrong if you do. It's all a big hoax, a conspiracy, a media frenzy. Read this article, this link, don't be afraid. My wife, husband, dad, grandparent, uncle, sister, brother, niece just passed away from COVID-19. Here are 25 things you need to do if you want to meet in your building again. My family's going to stay home for a while before coming back. Sorry, can't be there. Don't ever open the building again. Home is so much better. We need to open the church building. I need to be there and see everyone. What are you waiting for? And just like you can't please everyone in leadership, Gideon couldn't please everyone, and there were some problems. And in fact, sometimes problems in the future after a victory come in the form of pleasure. God gives us a trial and difficulty, and he also can test us in pleasure, in abundance. And that's what we'll see here. The Israelites actually want to make Gideon their king. We'll pick the story up in verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Now, if we stop the story there, it's like, man, Gideon's doing great. I don't know what the warning's for, Joel. You know, he he handled the the challenge uh, very diplomatically at the start of the chapter. And right here, he gets it right. He says, it's not about me. It's about the Lord. The Lord will rule over you. I can't be your king. But check it. That's what he says. Here's what he does. Verse 24. But, and I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder, It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, pennants, the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camel's necks. Gideon, well, we'll stop there. He takes this stuff. He takes the plunder. And you might be thinking, why would Gideon even ask for that? If you give Gideon the benefit of the doubt, he wants to memorialize the past. He wants to remember the victory that God gave. And I think that's true. And so the second warning would be, you can appreciate the past, but you can't live in it. You can admire what God's done, but you can't just think that God's done being God. He is a living God, an active God. He wants to create new creations and do a new thing among you and I. And so if you give Gideon the benefit of the doubt, you're like, oh, well, he just got a little bit off track there. But the reality is, check it. He takes the gold, which was a a way of saying, you're going to be my subjects. I want you to give me something. The the treasury is now started. 1,700 shekels of gold is about 43 to 50 pounds if you add in the other items. 50 pounds of gold in today's market, it's 1.3 million plus dollars. That's a pretty royal treasury. And speaking of royalty, what's he receive also? Purple linens, the the things that the kings wore, the the things that their camels wore. He's got this king thing feeling, right? He's kind of like, I'm not going to be your king. I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to kind of act like it. 
And so the second warning is to appreciate the past. But the third one, it reminds me of Uncle Rico in Napoleon Dynamite. If ever there was somebody that lived in the past, it was Uncle Rico. That guy constantly talked about yesterday. But the problem with the past is, is that, that you, can, you, cannot, you can miss what God's going to do in the present and especially in the future if you're too focused on the past. I mean, it's the reason we have big windshields and small rear view mirrors. It's the reason our legs are wired and built to go forward. We can backpedal, but not near with the speed and agility that we can run forward. And as I was praying this week, I felt like the Lord gave me something, kind of a revelation, at least for me, in my study of this. And here's what it is. You don't need a living God to worship the past. A dead God will suffice. If you're only going to talk about what happened, well, a dead God could have accomplished those things in the past, but only a living God could accomplish something right now. And so that's, that's a problem. It becomes almost idolatry in this point where, where they're totally thinking about the past and, and the living God is, is left out. And the third warning is this. It's annihilate pride. We have to anticipate problems. We have to appreciate the past but not live in it. We have to annihilate pride. Now you might be thinking that's a strong word, but check out what the story continues, how the story continues in Judges 8, 27b. So they give them all this stuff, this plunder. It says in 27, Gideon made the gold into an ephod, and he placed it in Ophrah, his town. Now, think about that for a second. Why would he do that? Well, the ephod was a, was a priestly garment or also a kingly garment. It was that of royalty, of, of high position, of authority. And so he's got this, this magnificent gold ephod that he's made, and he puts it, he doesn't walk around in it, so you think, oh, maybe he's a little humble. He puts it in his hometown of Ophrah, as if to say, yeah, our, our tribe, Manasseh, is the least, but check us out now, baby. Look who we are. Look what we've done. I mean, he's basically saying, you know what? You didn't think we could do anything, but we did. And he's usurping the position, the authority, the glory of God in a very subliminal way. Pride starts small, maybe even with one gold earring and another gold earring, but pride will move forward. And here's what happens next. It says, All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Now you think about that. I mean, Gideon, the story starts with him wiping out idols in his hometown, and at the end, because the Bible is clear and gives an authentic portrayal of our heroes and its people, it shows him literally creating an idol, not probably on purpose, but because of pride, by putting it in his hometown, by, by making it his Ephraim, he literally creates this idol. All, not some, all of Israel goes and worships there. And, and we think about the language. I mean, these are strong words. They prostituted themselves there. They cheated on God because of the actions of Gideon, because of pride. One translation said they played the harlot. Oh, that it would not be said of us that we played the harlot when it comes to our worship and adoration of God, that God alone would be the object of our worship. And in fact, here's what happens. It became a snare to Gideon and his family. Not just him, but his family as well. This one action became a trap. It became something that kept him tied. It did not let him be victorious as he moved ahead. Yes, there was peace in the land, but you'll see if you read on that the, the, the story of Gideon doesn't have a great ending. And so I think, I, I sit there thinking like, wait a minute, if we're trying to have this victorious living, why doesn't it end with Gideon in this great victory? It's because these warnings. Maybe he didn't anticipate the problems and he didn't think that, that, that with new levels come new devils, right? He, he kind of thought that things would be easy even though they were on top and they had beat 
beaten their adversaries. Uh, he, 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 he probably appreciated the past a little too much. In fact, he, he lived there. This, this earring meltdown thing, this, this kind of remembering thing was possibly a little bit of Uncle Rico, right? Hanging out in the past. And then lastly, he did not annihilate pride. And so the, the six keys, the truth, the secrets that we've talked about these last few weeks are that we have to have this deep dependence upon God. We have to have this, this ruthless obedience to God's word. We've got to flow and move in God's power, not in our own might. We have to have a daily, consistent, unceasing prayer life conversation. We can fleece things. We can clarify things. We can talk to God. We've got to do that if we want to achieve victory. We've got to understand that sometimes God's ways are not our ways and there's going to be an unlikely strategy to this victory that he's called us to live in all aspects of our life. And we got to have unflinching courage. And we see all these in the life of Gideon. But at the end of the story, there's a plot twist, a change, an unexpected ending as Gideon does not heed the warnings that we've talked about today, not quite fully anticipate the problems that would come his way in this position, not fully uh, understand that God still wants to do something new and not to uh, live in the past, right? To appreciate the past but not live in it. And he definitely didn't annihilate his pride. He used his mouth to say, I don't want to be your king, but his actions said otherwise. Well, it's hard to live victoriously. But the Bible does paint that picture of Gideon. In the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 includes Gideon in his hall of faith, his, his, his great list of heroes of faith, of those who lived the way God has asked us to live, who gained the victory, and maybe even in some cases in our worldly standards or definitions of victory, didn't, but they're included as victorious lives of faith. And Gideon's in that list. Doesn't get a lot of airplay, but he's in the list. And then the writer moves into chapter 12 of Hebrews. And I thought it was important to bring us to that point. He says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, that makes a snare, that weighs us down, that keeps us stuck, that doesn't let us have the next victory. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And you might be asking, well, how? Like, what if I forget those six truths or keys or secrets? Or like, how, let me give it to you in a nutshell. If you forget everything that we've talked about in this series, know this, that this next verse, Hebrews 12, 2, gives us the most clear and concise clue to victorious living Here's how you run with perseverance, the race that's marked out for you. Here's how you gain the victory. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. If you want to summarize everything we've talked about, if you want to embody victory in one single word, it's Jesus. And you and I, if we want to live victorious, if we want to truly have a vision of victory, we have to have our vision on the victorious one, the one that defeated death and conquered the grave, fixing our eyes on Jesus. He started our faith. He, he was the pioneer, the author, some translations say, and he's perfecting it. He is growing us. He is helping us achieve victory day after day after day. You know what? We're a forgetful lot. We're a forgetful people, man. And I'm so thankful to God for the gift of communion. This moment, this, this meal, this memory for us to fix our eyes on Jesus. And so in a moment, you're going to have a, just a little bit of time to, to commune. If you can in your home, hopefully you will. You'll take advantage of it. You'll have elements that represent the body and blood of Jesus You'll turn your heart and let God stir your affection and invite Holy Spirit in to show you if maybe you're falling to some of these warnings, you're got a little pride creeping up or you've been living in the past a little too long or maybe you just didn't expect some of the things you're expecting. You thought that, that when you became a Christian or when you had victory over this that you would have no other enemies or problems. But let's take this time to remember Jesus, to focus and fix our eyes on him because he wants to give us the victory. He is victory. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and to the full abundant life. We've talked a lot about that this year. 
a victorious and abundant life are synonymous. And that's what God wants for us. That's what Jesus avails to us. That's why Jesus came. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly, victoriously. And so if you're married, God wants you to have a victorious marriage. That's not churchy to say that's truth. He wants you to have victorious families if you have a family. If you've got a job, he wants you to have victory in your career. He wants you to have victory in your emotional understanding or your relationships. He wants victory to be the, the definition of us, that we would gain victory over every enemy. We might have, might have the Amalekites or the Midianites, but, but we can have victory over poverty. He would want us to have victory over racism and systematic oppression. Jesus is the key to the victory over violence and addiction and, 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 and abuse and human trafficking and, and, and anxiety. He's the, vict the, the, the victory over apathy. He's the victory over any evil, any enemy, anything that is not of God. The key to victory is Jesus. Oh, that we would walk in the victory through Jesus. And, and I ask God, like, how do, you, how do you wrap this up? You might think that you should give this big, inspiring speech, and maybe that was a little bit of it. But the Lord said, why don't you just read some truth? Why don't you just let my words be the encouragement? And so I just want to read Scripture to you, over you, for you, about victory that God has given us. 2 Corinthians 2.14 but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. For the Lord your God is He who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? And lastly, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father, I pray that we would have a vision of victory, that we would walk in victory, that we would fix our eyes on Jesus and let him perfect our faith and lead us and fight for us, and give us the victory. I thank you for your great love. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your power. And I thank you for the victory that is ours. And we look forward to the day of ultimate victory when you, Jesus, will return and every knee will bow. I pray that in, in the in-between time, the the moments of waiting in this fallen world. God, we would still know that victory can be ours and we would walk in it because of Jesus. And it's through his beautiful and powerful and victorious name I pray for a church I love. Amen. I love you guys.
Amen. Thank you as always for joining us for Bar at Home again this week. And remember, next Sunday, June 7th, we will have in-person gatherings. If you'd like to come and check it out, again, if you'll be here, we'll be here. And if you'll be there at Bar at Home, we'll be there. And we are excited. You'll be receiving an email uh, later this week with more details on what to expect and what that will look like. And as always, you can go to barchurch.com slash updates for our latest update, as this will be a busy and exciting week. And to preview all of that, we're going to have a vision night on Tuesday, uh, June 2nd. And you can go to barchurch.com slash updates as well. And there's a link there for you to RSVP. Again, you can attend the vision night in person or you can join us online through Zoom. The choice is up to you, but we are excited uh, to get the ball rolling in that direction. And as always, as, as we get ready to head out, we want to say if you need help in any way, and we mean anyway will you please just email us at help at barchurch.com and we'd be honored to help in any way we can and then if this is your first time to jo join us for bar at home would you please go to barchurch.com slash i am new and then you'll get a chance to click on a link and join and meet the staff uh, on a zoom call right after this gathering and again we'd be honored uh, just to get to see your face and get to know you uh, and if you have any questions at all about anything that's going on please just email us at hello at barchurch.com. I'm going to pray for us, and then we get to go be the church. Dear God, thank you for today. We need you, God. There's, there's disruption in this world. There's, there's, there's hatred. There's animosity. There's, there's, there's death. There's, there's, there's sadness. And so, Lord, I, I pray that we would feel your presence this week, Lord. We need you. We, we need peace and comfort and love. And so in the abilities that we can provide those in our humanly aspects and you moving through us, Lord, please let us be ready and willing to go and do that. And then in ways that only you can move, would you please move across the globe and, and our, our nation and our community, Lord, and, and then just let people be drawn to the wonder and the beauty and the love of you. So thank you for today. We ask for a continued hedge of protection for your love and your faithfulness in this area. Thank you for all you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next Sunday, Bara. Some of you here, some of you right back at Bara at home. We love you.